So welcome back. Now we have our panel discussion on future and science and technology in Hong Kong. Today we are honored to have the following VIPs here in the session. The Honorable Mrs. Fanny Law Van Chilfen, GPS JP, Chairperson of Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation. Mr. David Foster, Director of the Crochet Foundation, and Professor Tony Chen, the President of HKIS and HKUST, who is the moderator of the session. So now would um, Professor Chen please lead this session. Hey. Hey, thank you. So this is a fun part. Okay, so <laughs> no PPT. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm really happy and honored that both Fanny and David agreed to participate in this uh, panel. We want to keep this panel in a small number because we think really it should be everybody participate in the discussion. So, so the format is roughly this. We've told uh, Fanny and David that they will each have 10 minutes. By the way, the whole period is, say, 6 o'clock, we should finish. One hour, OK? Uh, 10 minutes, you, you give your personal view on basically the topic of science and technology development in Hong Kong. You, whatever you interpret. Okay. Hong Kong is part of China. Hong Kong is part of international. Uh, I think the only ground rule I have is uh, when we, especially when you get the Q&A, is no political questions, <laughs> OK? So don't, don't ask the audience, you know, what, what about what's happening in Admiralty or <laughs> what, what's going on. But politics or science is OK, hmm. I think. You know, so, OK, I think that part is OK. Uh, anyway, so each 10 minutes, uh, then then uh, we'll have a little discussion among us, maybe another 10, 15 minutes. And we'll open up. So we hope to leave, uh, say, roughly half an hour, at least 20 to 25 minutes for everybody to come in. I suspect the part of the discussion is about the three talks that we just heard. The three speakers are still uh, here. Uh, now, I just want to supplement the introduction to, uh, to Fanny and David a little bit. Uh, Fanny, of course, is the chairperson of the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park, obvious connection to science and technology. But as many of you know, just in case you don't know, uh, Fanny has a long tradition serving in government, different uh, roles. Uh, for example, he's currently also a member of the EXCO, Executive uh, Council. Before that, you were uh, uh, the deputy, whatever, the permanent secretary of the Education Bureau. So very much involved with, with, with education. Uh, without, in fact, we just found out she and uh, Gum Biu were classmates at Hong Kong U, or more or less, or about uh, within a year. And David, of course, is, has been, uh, what do you call the position, director? Or director, yes. Director of the Croucher Foundation. Before you came, I, I mentioned to the audience that Croucher, as a funder of science in Hong Kong, far precedes uh, RTC. Yes, that's They have been funding signs in Hong Kong for a long time. Uh, but of course, uh, you've been in Hong Kong personally for a long time. It's 95, yeah. Yeah, you, you know about Hong Kong. Before that, you were in the Royal Society, that's as right. I remember. So you Working know about how it works. Mainland China links, yeah. It may, yeah so, so I hope you speak a little bit from that perspective sure. as well, right? OK, so uh, lady first. OK. <laughs> well, I want to be short, since we have a very cozy group. I suggest we have more time for deliberation. In particular, I see many young, young faces here. Uh, I don't know what their plans are for their future, but uh, this is clearly an issue that I like to listen to the young people and see how government could provide more options for them. Um, if I may you know, just say, you know, for the fu on the future of science and technology of Hong Kong, I would say, if I start by saying, you know, Summarizing or using an analogy, I think we have all the ingredients for Hong Kong to develop into a Silicon Harbor in Asia. We have all the ingredients. We can say that we have a world-class university. We have uh, world-class uh, researchers. Uh, we have all the international connections. We have also outstanding students sponsored by the Croucher Foundation over the years. But unfortunately, we were not able to keep them in the science and technology field. Many of them become investment bankers or etriaries and all that. So, you know, what we lack is we have the ingredients, but we lack a recipe, a good recipe, and we don't have a good cook. For those of you who like baking, probably you know that if the, if the ingredients don't blend, 
we won't have good products. That is the situation that we are in. I think in terms of environment, um, until very recently, I think uh, the rule of law is very strong in Hong Kong. We have IP protection. Therefore, people like to come to Hong Kong rather than in China to start their businesses in particular in science and technology. Uh, we also have uh, excellent infrastructure. We have freedoms of speech. We have freedom of information. And we heard from uh, Professor just now that the reason why you want to locate a, a, a facility here is because there is no firewall. But just across the border, you have this firewall. So, so we have the favorable conditions. We have the ingredients. Um, and what should we be doing in order to promote science and technology? I think you have all heard the government, and particular this government, is going to give renewed impetus. I, I use the word renewed because, in particular, for young students, you may not be aware that as early as in 1997, our first chief executive, actually in his first policy address, said that you know his aspiration is to turn Hong Kong into a technology hub, and therefore he commissioned Professor Tian Chiangling to do a study to advise him on how to realize his vision. And Professor Ten published two reports. The final report was in 1999. He set out a series of recommendations. I would say these are recipes. Uh, and in fact, many of the recommendations have been implemented over the years. For example, the Science Park was established in 2012 as a result of Professor Ten's report and recommendations. We have ASTRI. We have a number of research centers. We have the Innovation and Technology Fund. These, were, these all arose out of that report. But critically, there were two recommendations, two key recommendations, which are the enabling factors, were sorrowfully missing the implementation. First is that there should be a holistic plan and there should be total commitment at all levels of government to support this vision. And we still find that our government operate in silo, in particular universities also operate in silo, I must say. And the other is that um, there has to be close collaboration between government, industry, and also the academia. I think these are the two enabling factors that have not been put into place, and this explains uh, what we see today. I think uh, individual institutions have done extremely well. We have the uh, University of Science and Technology being one of the best in, uh, you know, you, you, your ranking is very high, and clearly you are the leading university in Asia. More than that. CU and HAU are represented here. Yeah, right. Also, you know, they are also, you know, we, we have great universities, each of them doing extremely well. Science Park is doing very well. Uh, we have uh, excellent facilities and state-of-the-art laboratories and all that. We have near to full occupancy, etc. But because we all operate in silos, the impact is not felt. We have very successful individual companies but we have not created an industry out of science and technology. Nor have we you know, realized this vision of making science and technology really an, an economic pillar that, that counts. Um, so I would say what we therefore need to do is we need strong leadership within the government to champion for science and technology both within the government, because science and technology cut across all departments. EEDD, Environment Bureau, Education Bureau, are, all have to work together, as well as to champion for science and technology in the community. Uh, therefore, the chief executive has uh, at least already put a proposal to the legislature to establish a new policy bureau dedicated to science, innovation and technology. So I welcome you and encourage you, each of you, to write a letter. Every one of you send a letter to the legislature get them to approve that as soon as possible. We have got through one hurdle, but the biggest hurdle is with the Finance Committee. I don't know when this will be approved. The next step, therefore, is to find the right person to be the secretary. You know, after all, it's the person that counts. We need smart people to lead that bureau in order to achieve results. And I have approached some of the vice chancellors and they turned me down. <laughs> okay, but anyway. Um, and then this is uh, leadership is one thing. And I always say, um, you know, Nia has heard me say this before, there are key stakeholders in the community in, to form an ecosystem. Because innovation, we need an ecosystem in order for technology to thrive. 
And for this ecosystem, there are six pillars. First, of course, is government policy. There has to be enabling policy, there has to be government funding. And then second is investment. We need to have all these venture capitalists and angel funds to come in to support SMEs and startups. And then we need to change the culture of our people. Because parents today all want their children to be investment bankers, um, doctors, or lawyers, and, and all that. And we have to show them that young people with an aspiration to be a scientist can also live a very fulfilling life. May not be billionaires, although they are, like uh, Steve Jobs, and etc. but they may be the exception. But still, uh, you can have a very good future. And then we already have excellent infrastructure. This we do not worry. But human capital is another area that we have to invest in a big way, both in terms of secondary education, on STEM education, universities. We need more research postgraduate positions. And we also have to relax our immigration policy to let in more talents. Uh, and then the final piece is, of course, the market. We are talking about an industry that can make money for Hong Kong provide employment opportunities for our young people. And we need to link up the industries and make them realize what goodies they are. I think uh, University of Science and Technology has a very good initiative called Science for Lunch, where you invite all the investors and uh, industry leaders to come in to listen to new inventions. But I like this to be on a much bigger scale. If we could have a platform or a, a portal where all these uh, research that has a prospect for commercialization could all be put on this portal. So that industrialists who may be interested in particular subject can really approach the universities for details instead of waiting for you to organize a lunch. So, so these are some of the ideas that I have. And I think um, before the Bureau comes into being, um, Science Park has already reviewed its position and we want to be the centerpiece in this ecosystem and we want to move away from simply providing physical facilities to providing value-added services, including all these linkages with the stakeholders, uh, mentorship for our startups and all that. We also bring our companies to overseas exhibitions and pitching events to, to let them to and help them grow. Uh, these are value services. We want to move away from managing tenants to nurturing talents. And we want um, to really be the advocate uh, to promote science and technology in the community, working with the, the, the gifted education center, with the parents, and also with universities and all that. Um, for the past 12 months, we have done a lot of soul searching. Uh, the board of directors have just approved a blueprint for moving forward. So beginning from November, we hope to put all these pieces into action. And Tony has very kindly sat on our steering committee uh, for this major review, so he knows all about it. And if you have further questions, I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, this is by way of introduction, and I look forward to hearing your views on this. Okay? Thank you, Fanny. David? Thank you, thank you. So uh, it's really, thank, thank you to the, uh, um, for inviting me here. It's uh, quite a humbling experience because I'm not a scientist and I'm not involved in, I'm not in, a scientist. Um, <laughs> in uh, the science park or in government in a major way. But I do have a perspective, I suppose, in that um, uh, uh, I was, in fact, um, I had a place to read physics. So it's nice to be here and be a Marx physicist. I was about to become a physicist when I discovered suddenly a passion to learn Chinese. And then I switched my major. At the very last minute, my parents were quite surprised. Uh, I called them up and told them I was going to study China and Chinese history, Chinese language. So that uh, set my career on an interesting path because when I graduated, I was immediately offered a job at the Royal Society in London uh, to work on their program with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Oh, and so in those uh, years, I met um, um, many, many of the great names in Chinese science, and then I showed them around the UK. And I also had a chance to visit Hong Kong and then to visit China with various British scientists and delegation visits. And that really uh, um, sparked my interest in what was happening in Hong Kong in, uh, in contrast to mainland China. Because I, I do feel, and I feel particularly today, that we're at, uh, at an exciting time for Hong Kong science. 
and I've now been uh, working with Hong Kong science since, since the mid-80s, I suppose. But I think that now is a particularly exciting time I, um, because these ingredients I can sense are beginning to come together. I think that's the issue. The universities really are world-class universities, and then we have more and more young researchers coming back into assistant professorship, tenure-track assistant professorship. I think that the aims of education review, which took place in 2001 onwards, has, in a very quiet and modest way, actually helped enormously. Now we have the four-year degree, which allows people more space to think and, uh, and follow their own inclinations. But the school curriculum has changed a lot, too. And then we, we stripped an exam out of the system. And, uh, um, and I think that, um, so we're producing this generation of young people who I think are ready for science. Uh, I just hope that we can switch them on to science, uh, working jointly. So I think it's an exciting time. The funding situation, if, if uh, when I go back to Britain, it's pretty um, miserable there. <laughs> And then in the US, the funding situation is not fantastic either. But yeah. although Hong Kong scientists, like all scientists, complain about not enough money, and I think it's true that we're a bit overawed by some of these major funding initiatives in mainland China now. But actually, if we look past, uh, you know, the Croucher Foundation has been offering grants for 35 years now, and we look at how the funding environment's changed in Hong Kong, we're in a pretty benign situation now, I think, with every year an increase. And I think that if I was a, an assistant professor with a good idea right now, it wouldn't be too difficult, I think, to find funding. So uh, particularly, I like these uh, cross-disciplinary initiatives from RGC, and then the UGC has areas of excellence now. So there is some top-down, as well as these ideas bubbling up from the bottom. Uh, and I think what I always remember is that it's very, very early days. So the Croucher Foundation, I think, was the first source of research funding for Hong Kong scientists and was established only in 1979, uh, then RGC only in 1991. So it's very baby steps, actually. We're early days uh, when we think the Royal Society has been operating since 1660. And then the first chairman of the Croucher Foundation was a Nobel laureate from Cambridge, Lord Todd. He, he, he got his Nobel Prize in 1953. And then he'd been trained in Germany before the war. And so the, the, there's a sense that Hong Kong is arriving, arriving a quite a long time after that. But, but um, we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves, I think. We've made incredible progress in the last 35 years. Uh, Two weeks ago, I was invited to the Sino-British Fellowship Trust reunion in Hong Kong, and I met Professor Rosie Young there, and yeah. Professor Sir David Todd, and then uh, I think the first scholar to go after the war was Professor Sir Harry Fang, who went to, this, and then there was Professor Marlin. They all got the Sino-British Fellowship Trust scholarship, and they went out from Hong Kong to uh, uh, follow their, for, to pursue science, basically, and then came back and that was really the beginning, I see, of, of science. So I think that uh, I encourage Hong Kong, uh, I encourage us to feel proud, really, of what's been achieved. And I certainly feel proud that the Croucher Foundation over the years has played a very small part in that um, process. But I think I, I, I've got more to say, particularly in relation to mainland China and then uh, uh, opportunities for young people. Uh, but, but I'll stop there, and then we can open up the discussion. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, that sets us off on a good, good foundation for discussion. Let me start off by uh, pointing out a simple fact. That is, one thing, Fanny, you talk mostly about is on innovation and technology. And the implicit assumption that that has an impact on the economy, jobs, either for the whole economy and also for the young people who pursue them. That's very important. Uh, uh, you know, that's Professor Tian, right? Tian Chen, and that's all that. Today, we heard some talks on really basic science. Yeah. Basic science that you also heard that eventually they will be really useful for, for technology, for the economy, for jobs. So I, wanna, I want us to keep that in mind. That is, what's Hong Kong's role on both aspects? I would suspect in Hong Kong, at least we have more discussion on the first kind. You know, we're talking about building a bureau. Even that is a uphill battle. I, I, I talk to many people in Hong Kong. It's okay. So that, that's that. 
So since we have a lot of basic scientists here, you know, so I think that you can imagine is even more of an uphill battle. So that's, that's, a, that's a question one, that is, do we do both? We pick one, we need different strategy for, for one. Uh, okay, that's why I just want to put out another question because it's related to this. And the other elephant in the room is China, okay? I mean, you heard all of this stuff, uh, the, the, the big signs, big basic signs. Uh, China is making a, a lot of investment, trying to take some global leadership. It has actually participated in some of these, like Dial Bay. Uh, and if you think about Hong Kong's role, right, what should Hong Kong contribute? How should Hong Kong participate? Both financially, intellectually, and in terms of human capital. So, so two aspects. I just want to throw that out. So maybe, Benny. But you, I, can start. Yeah. I think we should proceed on both fronts, basic science and applied science. The reason why I focus more on applications because I think this is the weaker of the two legs at the moment. Because the translation from basic research to applied research, that there is a big gap here that needs to be filled. Um, as regards your second question, I think it's a big advantage for Hong Kong to have China right next door. Because we are under one country, two systems, there is, we can leverage the resources and the talents in China to help us promote uh, this science and technology in Hong Kong. And, and in fact, uh, you know, Hong Kong can play the a bridging role between the outside world and China. There are more and more uh, Chinese companies or Chinese researchers wanting to come to Hong Kong and also invite international researchers to station in Hong Kong, like what a professor has just said. The international team would prefer to work in Hong Kong. And Tsinghua University, you know, this is still not yet, it's, it's still under discussion. Tsinghua University, for example, would want to set up a lab in Science Park because many of their students uh, may not want to go back to Beijing, but they would love to work in Hong Kong. So this is the advantage. And because we have IP protection, we have a sophisticated lifestyle, we speak English here in Hong Kong. So this is a big advantage. And I, I have told Tony about uh, this um, report that I recently came across. This is called the China Science and Technology Development Report 2012. And I was actually quite amazed about the width, the breadth of research that they cover and the depth, the achievements that they have already attained over the years. So, you know, I have been telling my colleagues that we should not be just go overseas to the West to look for an innovation, but rather we should go more to mainland to see. And um, the Science Park has already signed up a number of MOUs, but of course, some of the MOUs are just very <laughs> superficial documents. And if we really drill down and, and um, work with a, a few cities, for example, Shenzhen, Guangdong, and the Pan Pearl River Delta area, I think there is a lot of room for us to grow together. And during tea break, I was saying that I have this grand vision about um, leasing land in Yangsha for Hong Kong to develop a second or small Hong Kong. Maybe we lease land for 50 years. There are no reporters here. You're huh? really my dream, <laughs> rather far-fetched dream. Uh, if we have land, if we, uh, and given that um, University of Science and Technology already have a research base there, this is a very good place to tack onto what is already there. And because the Falk family has built housing, have a marina there, and they want to turn it into a very uh, cosmopolitan European city. That is a, you know... But Nam Sao is also one of the special zones in the 12, five-year plan. Yeah. Not yet. No? Not yet. They, are, they, have a, they want to apply. They still not... Uh, I thought there was... Uh, it's like Qin, uh, Qin Hoi and Zhu Hoi. Only Qin Hoi, only Qin Hoi and Zhu Hoi, but not, but not Nam Sao. But Nam Sao has put in an application to be a free trade zone. But that has been called, a, China has called a stop to it because uh, every place wants to put in an application to be a free trade zone. So they want to see how the Shanghai free trade zone operates before approving others. But, you know, land is really a major constraint. And our consultation process, our politics is really standing in the way of much more speedy action. And we cannot afford to wait now because we are already lagging behind. That's why I have this bold idea of 
But I don't know whether I've answered your question. No, no, yeah, you addressed it. So David, what's your take? I mean, given that Croucher mission is to support basic science, if I yes, understand, yes, right? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. What's your take on this? Yeah, so, uh, well, I think, of course, basic science is uh, uh, beginning, the beginning of the whole enterprise, isn't it? But I think that basic science, of course, will lead to innovation and then uh, uh, within a knowledge-based economy will eventually be uh, absolutely key to economic development. And so uh, what is important, I think, is, is, uh, uh, is the leadership, as you said, and then to, to get the ingredients to blend together well, to make our, our nice cake. I think what's pretty interesting is that we imagine that America is very entrepreneurial and risk-taking and that the market, it has free markets and then the market really takes care of everything. But if we stand back and look at the way that American innovation really happens, actually the American government goes much further than many governments, I think, in supporting ideas and bringing ideas close to the market because they have, for example, the DARPA, they have the Department of Energy, they have the NIH. These organizations actually, uh, in the same way that the Science Park now is incubating, nurturing ideas, uh, uh, quietly are taking people much closer to the market than we imagine. We have to go past this American idea of everything being free, free, freewheeling and entrepreneurial, I think. Quietly, the government is doing a lot. Uh, and is, has been quite systematic, quite strategic. So I, I really do feel excited about this new bureau. I, 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 I uh, um, reiterate this call. We should all uh, push for this bureau to yeah. take place as soon as possible. It needs to have strong leadership, and it really has a very crucial, critical role to play right now, I think. And I think one of those roles is uh, how, how, uh, getting onto the mainland China question and how Hong Kong interacts with mainland China. It must be very strange, I think, for the leadership in Beijing to interact with Hong Kong when there's no Minister of Science or no, no, uh, no obvious person to go to in terms of science. Uh, so I think that will make things much easier to have, have make the relationship uh, gel together. Um, but also, um, I can tell just a little story of, um, from the Lindau meeting in, uh, on Bodensee on Lake Constance in Germany. That's been running for 60 years now. It's the meeting of Nobel laureates every living Nobel laureate in a field. Uh, the first year I went was physics. Every Nobel Prize winner in physics was there living. And then 600 young scientists from all over the world. And then Hong Kong, through the Croucher Foundation, was invited to nominate young scientists for the first time. So I went with a delegation of young Hong Kong scientists who then interacted with the Nobel laureates and with their counterparts uh, across the world. 600 brilliant oh. young physicists. Who, who was the first person I met in Singapore was uh, Tony Tan, mm -hmm. the president uh, in, uh, in Lindau. Tony Tan, the president of Singapore. And he was there because he saw this great opportunity to promote Singapore. Yeah. And they had a Singapore day, a whole Singapore day. And they had a Singapore evening, and we ate Singaporean food. Yeah. And they had Singapore folk dancing. And uh, it was just a platform to promote Singapore to these young scientists. Well, Singapore yeah. is very good at promoting uh, the country. Right, right. Oh, right. it's much more low key. Low key. Low key. Maybe yeah, yeah. because we don't have um, a chief secretary or That's whatever what I to, thought. to, yeah, to yeah. hold up the flag. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I did think that um, uh, uh, this bureau, I could imagine the head of the bureau actually uh, being able to, not just in Lindau, but around the world, being able yeah, to, right. to be the voice of Hong Kong science, really. Yeah, but I think to be fair to Singapore, <laughs> so I think they, they actually take action other than promotion. Yes. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. So people like Tony Tan, you know, he was the whatever the chancellor of uh, NUS actually, or he became president of the country. Uh, they they have policies. I think that's where we can imitate, uh, learn or uh, that part of. Uh, they have a very clear blueprint, and they are very uh, focused. They invest a lot in that. I think this is an area that we can learn. Uh, in terms of. Um, uh, freedoms, I think we have a lot of more freedoms and we encourage more bottom-up initiatives, whereas Singapore is very much top-down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I yeah. think in Hong Kong, we should have a balance. While we have uh, some broad directions as to where we can, should invest more, we should allow some flexibility for innovators themselves to realize their vision. I, I totally agree. I think and we have the proximity to mainland, which yeah. Singapore doesn't have, and the relationship with mainland. and. Uh, 
Uh, certainly, if I was a young researcher thinking about where to set up my research group, I would come here. Very good, very good endorsement. I, have a, I want to come back to this issue about innovation and technology versus basic science. Because one view is, you know, one, one, one precedes the other, right? So you sort of work it out. But I was just talking to many people, just even now at coffee break. There's another view, and that is uh, basic science is a good way to attract the talents, the young people. I don't even mean university, even pre-university. And you sort of train the workforce. You heard that in astronomy and particle physics, that these people, they don't have to pursue a career in particle physics for the rest of their lives, right? They, the, the, the skill they've learned will be very useful. They can found the next uh, you know, internet company or whatever, okay? So I, I want to ask uh, in particular, Fanny, because you know the Hong Kong government well. So what, what do the Hong Kong government and to some degree society think, what was the best way to convince them that investing in basic science is, uh, is, is the most, you know, it's actually effective for the whole society in the long term, not just in terms of producing the next product, Right, so that, this well, is the yeah. vice chancellor talking, pitching for funding for university. No, no, I'm not talking about funding. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying training the young people up. Okay, it's just another view. No, no, view. no. Yeah. You know, I said earlier that I, I, I agree. Um, you know, the university training is very important, and therefore I fully uh, support providing more funding, in particular for research postgraduate at the university. I think we are still the the number of doctorate positions in universities still uh, insufficient. In terms of basic research, I don't know how much you get now, but already in recent years, I think there was a fund for basic research at 18 billion or whatever, was that? Maybe I can correct. I'm, I'm not arguing for funding for the university. I don't mean, <laughs> I don't mean give more physics, uh, you know, more money. I'm thinking in terms of thinking about basic science as a general investment in human capital especially for young people, even before they come to university. It, it, that's, the, that's what I'm thinking. That's natural, because you have to come through that stream before you can go that downstream, because it all comes from basic research. And a way of thinking comes from Do this basic Do people in the Hong Kong government share your view? See, that's what I'm trying to get at, because it's easy to convince these guys here. They're, they're, they're already in the choir. So I'm asking, I understand it's easier to convince government officials that you know, technology and innovation can bring in more immediate benefit. But even that is an uphill battle, we agree. I'm thinking about what's the right way to convince the government and indirectly society that we need to invest in. Well, I, I, I think you have to go through the UGC and through the UGC to the Secretary for Education and then through to the Financial Secretary. And, and I think in future, the ITB bureau, the bureau chief, should also um, see this very point and that's why I wish is someone from the academia becoming the secretary. And then that person would be able to provide the link between the academia and also uh, the industry. And I, I fully subscribe to the view that, you know, it's from the basic research. You know, universities are the hotbed for innovation. Well, I, it seems to me that uh, if we look at the statistics, Hong Kong does extremely well at schools level in the science. Uh, it's very competitive. I think uh, probably Shanghai, Hong Kong have amongst the best. Well, no, taking exams. The, the, <laughs> you're taking exams, yeah. PISA, so, right. so the PISA, PISA. Uh, surveys. But it does seem that Hong, young Hong Kong people have very uh, busy, busy lives to me. They have a lot of pressure on them. and They have this exams pressure. Too. So I, I do think there's probably work to be done in persuading parents that uh, idle time, time just spent, uh, uh, as Einstein himself spent, um, um, uh, daydreaming is important too. That's probably not I, enough daydreaming. I, I pin a lot of hope on the Gifted Education Center, which Dr. Ng now gets. And, and I think Science Park is willing to support the secondary school students by providing internship and also uh, activities within the Science Park to expose them to science. That's nice. I want to ask one last question before we open yeah. it up to the audience. I want to bring it back to our three speakers today. Yeah. You know, if you look at them, it turns out, as you heard, that all three of them are from Hong Kong. Yeah, I mean, we're born here. I don't know. Uh, two of them, all three of them, uh, well, two of them did their undergrad in the US. Uh, the third went to Hong Kong U, but also went overseas. 
This is the model of our generation. There was no opportunity. Uh, but now, do you think that now is a little bit different? You heard about the ambition, the possibility. Uh, every one of them actually spoke about it. As Hong Kong reached a critical point where they say, instead of just always go out, why don't we build something here? Not, not to not let people go out. I think everybody should go out. But to have the focus be here, that other people will also come here. That's a very different thinking, you know? The, are we ready for that? Aren't we already trying to make our universities much more internationalized? We should be good enough to attract people from other places to come and study here. But I don't think it's a bad idea for some of our students to go overseas and be um, exposed to a different culture and different you know, environment and then come back and work in Hong Kong. I welcome that too. Uh, that should be a two-way flow. And it with, doesn't take 40 years. <laughs> no, no, but with, uh, with, uh, with four years of um, uh, undergraduate, um, there are much more opportunities for exchanges. That, yeah. that is healthy. And you know, I think our, some of our universities are already good enough. In particular, UST, Hong Kong U Chinese University, you are already attracting a lot of people, even at the postgraduate level, to come to you. So that's... that's and we, you know, I would really call on uh, Hong Kong persons who have returned to Hong Kong to work to link up with your colleagues or your friends in overseas and encourage them to come back. I was in San Diego uh, in June. I was in uh, Imperial College in um, September. And I'll be going to Boston uh, next week. And I, I always meet local academics, and many of them, with a lot of achievements, they were from Hong Kong. I want them to come back to Science Park. And, and this is the way to gather our talents, because I think we do have a gap somehow. Hey, up to the floor, anybody? How would that end? Hey, um, oh, there, he's on. I graduated in back and talked to the Form 6 students. Asked them how many of them are interested in science. Oh, asked them, sir, what they want to be doctors. Anyone interested in science? Not a single one. So now I don't know, that's just a sort of random small sample. I don't know what is this among the young people. How many of them are really aspiring to, to be science or something? About the uh, in jobs, making money, and so on. Because if the students don't show interest, being oh, so I I don't know. I mean, I, you asked them, but not I, at that time. I mean, I'm going to go back again next. Uh, September, I'm going to ask the same question and see the second time around them. If that were, that clearly is one occasion. If that were generally true among schools in Hong Kong, then I'm especially if you're talking about science. Maybe I could um, uh, say, just respond in terms of the Croucher PhD scholarship program, because that's been operating for 35 years now. And I think that if there'd been a drop off, in interest in science, and we would have seen a fall off in applications. But in fact, we've, we're seeing more applications, sort of a gradual increase in the number of applications. That, but more importantly, we're getting very, very good quality applications coming through. The full cost PhD scholarships uh, and benchmarked against the no to go overseas. The Hong Kong persons? Or just They're all permanent Hong Kong residents. So these are the YN graduates or the uh, DGS graduates, yeah. But I think within the school population, I mean, this is just a small sample because, uh, but, but there would always be, be uh, enough people to apply for these. We would award about 20 every year. Your question actually relates to the culture issue that I mentioned. Um, there is no question that there are many science students and outstanding science students. And one of the reasons why students pick science because they think it's easier to get score high marks in the DSE exam because it's more objective rather than very subjective writing essays. 
But once they get into university, many of them choose um, non-science streams for actuary. So the engineering faculties, I was told um, by one of the university professors, that the score of these engineer um, entrants is declining. And this is a cause for concern. And of course, we are trying to change the situation by inviting some of the very successful technology entrepreneurs to go to schools to tell them how they get with, to where they are. And this is something that the Science Park has recently started to organize. Uh, in a way, there could be several reasons why that may be true. One is uh, that young kids, when they're in high school, they, they actually interest. There's no platform for them to yeah. further develop. But that's not contrary to, you know, Professor in that case, you know, they, they have talented, yeah. talented youth, right? Yeah. So, so what happened along the way? It could be that. That's right. But I'm trying to get so one. One is by the time they, they get a little older, they, they say, okay, I have to now think about my career. And uh, parental pressure, peer pressure, whatever advice, that, that, that's one way. Now, the other thing is even worse. That is, none of them are interested in science even early on. So, okay. Then it has to do with our whole education system. That's Obviously, not, that's, not true. that's not true. In our generation, I know that's not true. When you look at people here, we all went to high school in Hong Kong, so that obviously is not true. Even today, I think there are many students who are interested in science. That's why every year we have uh, recently over a thousand students uh, doing, you know, join the summer camps, uh, science camp in, in the mainland, going to many universities and have internship. And, uh, and I attended one of their feedback sessions, and they found it so interesting. They were they were amazed about this progress in China. So the feedback is still very positive. Something must have happened along the way. So somewhere they say, okay, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer. All of them. Because according to that, none of them. But, but in the <laughs> end, not everybody can get into the science of medicine, medical schools. So but we just have to work hard on culture. Culture is an issue. One, one. Sorry. Well, I, I'm, I, I don't know. Uh, I have been in touch with um, Education Bureau and with uh, Dr. Ng. We want to do, do more in secondary schools. And as far as Science Park is concerned, uh, this summer we uh, engaged over 200 uh, students from secondary schools to come to Science Park and have our entrepreneurs talk to them and they have hands-on experiment and all that. And we also have a role show. Uh, demonstrate, show the stories of our heroes from Science Park. And that was very well received. Uh, Times Square, Lee Heisen Space. Uh, I, I can suggest something. Yeah, okay. You know, the fact that three of our speakers are all from Hong Kong and leading yeah. international science, I, I think there's zero coverage in the media. None of them know about this. You name, you ask people, who once led the US investment in the largest astronomy project in the world? They would not have guessed as a Hong Kong person. You see, you ask them who discovered okay. the top ten signs in, you know, in 2012. They would not have thought in U.S. Okay, the top leader in the U.S. They would not have thought it was the Hong Kong people. No, no what, there was what, no coverage. What we intend to do at the science park in yeah, future is maybe we should invite some of the top scientists in, uh, in Hong Kong, and then invite secondary schools who are interested, secondary students who are interested to come to the science. Park. You can give a talk to students who are interested. We, we run an annual um, science activity for schools with the Education Bureau and with uh, Science Museum. We, uh, this year we got 16,000 school students came along over, yeah. over uh, two or three weeks actually. In the end. And so uh, uh, um, uh, that's something that the Crash Foundation will be very interested in, in talking to Science okay. Park about. You, and, you, uh, you can sponsor us. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We're and, very keen. And not, and not only that, we want to set up a Facebook group for all the students who have come to our events. So to push to them information about science development and Facebook group is growing now. In terms of the um, primary school and secondary school um, students um, demonstrating their interest in basic science, I've got a personal experience with the Science and Innovation Center because they have an annual competition and every year um, a lot of primary and secondary school students, they actually submit um, their science research reports or their um, inventions. 
And and I see that actually there are a lot of talented and promising very young scientists from that age, and they are all locals. So I think that's another example to say that actually in Hong Kong, there's a significant population of young people who are interested. But as for um, how their minds change um, as they grow older, then that's probably an issue. And my point, my, my question here is that um, actually I'm a PhD student. I'm in my final year at the University of Hong Kong. I'm a local, I, I was born here. Um, what I see is over the last four years, I don't see many local Hong Kong postgraduates, especially at the PhD level. And I actually find doing basic science research um, pretty lonely in that sense. So what do you see as the issue here that not many locals are um, doing PhD studies? I think this relates to employment. Uh, if we can identify jobs, uh, if we have a multinational company, that's why I, I think government has to spend money, but they have to spend money wisely. Instead of just giving money to companies to, to do whatever investment in products, I would rather prefer to sponsor them in employing our science graduates to help them to do this. I, would, I don't support that ESS scheme that they now introduce. I think we should invest in human capital. And if there are jobs, people would go into that. And in fact, uh, we have, uh, you, know, you know, Albert, 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 uh, Yu, Albert Yu, and he, he, he left the uh, University of Science and Technology, he went to Beijing. And he always said, if the government would sponsor some Hong Kong graduates, he would readily employ a few. But that's the way to go. Looking around the world, one um, interesting solution might be to use a the thematic approach with some grand projects like yeah. uh, big data, for example, or um, new materials. Map. Or, uh, yeah. uh, or advanced materials or, or uh, regenerative medicine. These kind of, these, these are the critical themes, I think, within 50, 100 years that are going to be uh, important to the Hong Kong economy. And then um, it might be possible then to persuade some parents, because I think often parents are the big influencers, uh, that, um, that it's not only possible to have a career in, in science in Hong Kong, but actually it's critical in terms of if you think ahead with an aging population and pressure on resources uh, and, and, and very competitive uh, economic environment. So, so again, it's about leadership, isn't it? And have some of these uh, exciting, vibrant themes which people can relate to, and then we can begin to invest. In, in fact, if you talk about this, uh, last night I was with a group of um, technologists and IT professionals in fact, not just IT consultants and all that, a mixed group. And we were talking about smart city, how to make Hong Kong a smarter city. And, and we thought about grand challenges. Yes. Throw open some ideas. How about smart mobility? Now that I've retired, I don't have a chauffeur or whatever, I just find it annoying that having to stand in the bus stop for 20, 30 minutes before you can get a car, you know, wait for the bus to come. So there are many ways of... Maybe not new technologies, just very simple sensors, combination of technologies to make life easier for people. Yeah. It solves your problem. <laughs> not, 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 not only that. Well, there are many ways. So anyway, there were many ideas about problems that an individual face on a day-to-day -day basis. We could use grand challenges to encourage students to come up with ideas. This would also help our SMEs because under the government tender rules, very often only the big companies get the job. Oh no! Yeah. Hey, maybe I will say a few words. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, 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 oh. I yes, Doctor. Go ahead, and then. Okay, and then since Gift Education was mentioned several times, so I think I have to say a few <laughs> words. <clears throat> First of all, about the um, the interest of students, I think in my um, in my duty as the uh, working in the Gift Education. I do see a lot of secondary school students interested in science. And actually, they show very strong interest, I would say. And um, that number is actually not that small. I would say there are several hundreds per year of the order of that. But then they're discouraged for um, one reason is what you have already mentioned, which is the uh, peer pressure. Especially nowadays, I think the parents of this group of students compared with our parents are very different. 
I think my parents um, basically allowed me to do anything I want. They don't want to say anything. But nowadays it's very different. I mean, the parents have very strong view on what, this, what their kids should do. So this is one thing. But I want to also say another factor, which I think was not mentioned, uh, in terms of how these kids are being discouraged. Uh, one problem is the following. Um, th that, that happens even when they, are, even when they enter an uh, undergraduate program, which is that uh, the Hong Kong students typically, because of the education uh, way, the, the, the way they are educated, um, their mentality of doing, uh, of doing research is actually not very, um, uh, not too correct, I mean, in a way. So um, compared with the undergraduates from, let's say, mainland China, I think a typical, fac typical faculty in, as, as, let's say, UST would like to uh, take a mainland student other than Hong Kong student. Very often not because of the ability of the Hong Kong student is worse, but they are, they are less well prepared in terms of some basic way of thinking about science. And actually that is, I think, one of the problems which, well, when I'm doing gift education, uh, this is one problem I face, because if I want to make sure that these kids continue in science, I have to convince some university faculties to, to lead them, um, to do some project or whatever. And this is the difficult part, because usually the Hong Kong kids are not uh, that well trained to, be, um, to learn by themselves. Actually, that is, I think, the, 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 uh, the most dif yeah, different part, difficult part. They are used to be guided very systematically. But in doing research, very often you have to learn by yourself. Just try out whatever you want to try. And that mentality is actually missing in Hong Kong education system, I think. Sorry to hear that, because in the education reform, the core theme is learning to learn. Yes. All oh, right. That's true at too, you say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> in Israel, the uh, Weizmann Institute yeah. has its own uh, high school, doesn't it? And it's a science high school. And so I think that within that <laughs> locality... I always encourage, uh, you know, professor to set up a... A high school. A high school, a senior good, yeah. high school, yeah. a senior yeah. high school. Uh, talk about a science magnet school. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Any okay. volunteer? I think it works very well. well volunteer. You know, maybe that lady should, you know, your, your first job would be to help uh, <laughs> Professor Chen to set up a science magnet school. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Uh, I think Fanny bring up a, a, a lot of good points. I, I agree very much, uh, particularly on the government should take the lead in uh, promoting the right kind of uh, ecosystem to, to facilitate science. So the, the question is, uh, how, how do we do that? I mean, maybe we should... Uh, solicit uh, different kind of suggestions, and I have one. I have one suggestion that I, will, I would like to make now. Okay, um, I think one thing the government can help is to support the academic societies in Hong Kong. The reason is, previously Hong Kong do not have a, a, a very large research society. I mean, that, that's only built in the last two decades. And I observed that many of the uh, scientists, actually they work very alone. But very, very few cases I find that they would uh, actively, socially involved with the other university, or uh, in fact, even for HKIS, for, for, our, uh, for this society, it has been struggling all the time. It's a very, very difficult to get colleagues uh, to you know, join them, uh, maybe you know, in a, a kind of a friendly, a social way. So maybe one very small investment the government can make is to help to promote the academic societies in Hong Kong. Now, you, someone may say, well, in the United States or Europe, you know, they don't need to do that. I mean, uh, but they, they have a much bigger uh, society. And, and they already really mature. Now, in the case of China, they do get a lot of support from the government. So they, because they have to bring it up. In Japan also, okay, we work with the, like the Biophysical Society in Japan, they get strong support from the government. So I think one thing the government should do, I mean, this is a very small investment, is to support, support the, uh, the, the promotion or the operation of the academic uh, society so that they can bring the colleague you know, together and, and get more cooperations between. And also, you mentioned about the the promotion, like you know, being the uh, uh, the platform to let the industries and the academic to meet together. I think the academic society can do a better job than the uh, university because university is uh, have their own territory. But the academic society, they are they across uh, different uh, boundary of different institutions. So maybe. Uh, 
you can think about that. But maybe, Professor, you can. Yeah, uh, very quickly. You know, we have a Hong Kong institution of science, right? In fact, it was, uh, I think the origin was there were several, so many society and we were together. And also, uh, our emphasis is on the young people, like this morning, right? One emphasis is on, yeah? Because we don't have staff, we don't have office, and so it depends on volunteer time from faculty. And the faculty is already very busy, so therefore it's very difficult for them really to work for the uh, Hong Kong IS. Okay? So if, if the government can provide help such as office or staff member, then they can do a much better job. I think Fanny is asking me to explain a little bit. There's some discussion in Hong Kong with the government involved in some way about forming a Hong Kong Academy of Science, okay, which is slightly different in nature from HKIS. Okay. So the Hong Kong Academy of Science, the idea is like the Royal Society, a reference was made directly to that, the US Academy of Science and Engineering, and also the Chinese Academy of Science. The idea is that you have, of course, a number of academicians, but you also use that platform to advise government that's actually the most important part of the, let's say the U.S. part, but also to, not education in the sense of what universities do, but a more broader sense of promotion of science and policy. So I know the, I've been involved in that as on the fringe, and uh, I know the Hong Kong government, the current government, is very supportive of that. The discussion is actually going on. In fact, I was going to say something about it in our AGM. You know, in, in, in uh, 15 minutes or whatever, you know. So, so I think that's an encouraging thing. I mean, if that will happen, there will be, I hope there will be some government support for the umbrella thing. and It, it, will, it will help. Whether it's actually IS or actually AS, that, that's a secondary thing. Uh, more even uh, a grassroots kind of, uh, for example, like for the Hong Kong physics, uh, physics Society, Hong Kong Neuroscience Society, and that sort of thing. I mean, we can support many, many societies. I mean, they don't need a lot of support. It's just a small amount of support as a kind of a, you know, help them to, to get to the ground, you know, to have a solid ground to build up. And I think that would be, that would be helpful. How, how much? How much do you think yeah, it would take? Talking. Uh, how much? <laughs> oh, oh, I see. I, I'm very, really, I'm very really happy that culture is. I, I think for the HKS, actually, it's just a umbrella uh, organization promoting science. Now, to maintain an office and maybe hire at least one secretary. I think you can estimate. You know, this you are not talking about a large budget. We are talking maybe something like uh, two hundred thousand per year, something like that. You know, and, and, and but right now we, we have zero budget, okay, and we, which is very very difficult to operate. So so we are not talking about large amount of sum. Well, I think we have to clarify the objectives of these platforms. I I really don't not I'm not sure whether we want just to have social organization, but in fact, the science park um, we have we ha we are we are considering whether to have a thematic platform. For example, at present we have clusters, you know, biotech cluster, electronic clusters, and but we know that in new, you know, in new sciences, actually it cuts across disciplines. So we are thinking about having a sort of a robotics platform or a 5G platform where we bring all the, it, it, these are virtual platforms. So professors still work in their respective universities, but want to bring them together from time to time to share their research findings. For example, UST is very strong in antenna. City U is also doing some antenna. Chinese U is doing some antenna. But there, there are merits in getting all these professors together to find out how they differ and what they have achieved. And maybe they could inspire each other to improve on their own research. That sort of platform we want there, to set no up. There's no conflict. I mean, what, what uh, I Donald that... is talking about is really social. Class? No, no, not social. No, no, not it's social, professional. Not social. Professional. professional, you know, there's the Hong Kong Institute of Engineering, you are the Hong Kong whatever biophysics or 
So I think there's a professional. Yeah, yeah, this is worldwide. Yeah, this yeah is particularly one. You know, take this HKIS Hong Kong Institution of Science as an example. It's not a social organization. It also it cut across many disciplines and cut across the boundary of many universities. So now I, I'm very really glad to hear that Science Park is doing something. You know, maybe uh, along that line, but. I think Hong Kong is a big place. In order to promote the science, okay. we really need to do, you know, we have many, many different ideas has has to be tried out. You have so, the financing. Go to culture. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. I, I, think, I think that, that, that would be great. I think that it would be, be good great. to write a few lines and send an email okay. to me. Uh, maybe one last question. Yeah, exactly. I'm feel, I'm no, we need, we need some views from young people. Come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe let me just say a few words. Uh, since okay, I have left Hong Kong okay, for 40 years, certainly my point does okay, not represent the party. However, you know, based on okay, say, my recent interaction and collaboration with colleagues back here, I can see you know, okay, you know, one of the fundamental problems of sustaining the okay, that we all okay, agree, the younger generation actually do not see any future lines. Uh, if they don't see any future, then naturally, you know, they what will be interesting. And you know, one way uh, you know, I be able to solve the problem, they have the government to take the lead, establish okay some kind of uh, they say research institute. Ever, so that you know, younger generation, they choose to, and become okay, just okay, say a research scientist, or in that institute. Also, as we know, okay, basic science, some kind of a nurture, not okay, buy it with money. Culture will take a long time to establish. Again, okay, you cannot expect to see any results in five or ten years. It's a long-term investment, and and the only okay, say agency that can provide this kind of okay, environment is the government. If the government doesn't send any positive and very com, you know, say very definitive commitment, nobody will care. Same thing in the U.S. I think. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's you 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 bring a very interesting point. I mean, for instance, now okay. You know, people say, well, okay, I cannot find a job. But on the end, if you look at, okay, the, the U.S. Okay, job market, actually, there's a million, okay, position not filled. Because, okay, that requires, okay, technical skill that the younger generation doesn't have. Well, uh, okay, there's a question from a young person, so we're willing to All extend. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, on. Yes. Hello? Yes. Um, actually, I have a su suggestion here. Uh, I really uh, agree to uh, Professor's idea that we maybe a some kind of Hong Kong Academy of Science may be helpful. However, I think uh, this kind of idea is so uh, the, the pressure is so uh, the pressure is so high for the government to push all the way uh, to set such a kind of a. Uh, 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 give such a kind of funding for the science of academy. So instead of set of such kind of academy, I would like to say that uh, the only advantage of Hong Kong is uh, from policy. So actually, uh, from my point of view, because I'm a, a PhD student from mainland China, uh, yes, the information technology in Hong Kong is very advanced, and also here it's very free. And uh, uh, it's really free for Hong Kong to accept uh, uh, the whole uh, people from all around the world to come to Hong Kong and collaborate together. So what I say is that maybe we can set uh, a kind of uh, science and technology center. And uh, the, what the government should do is only to set such kind of environment and invite uh, particularly invite those um, uh, science and technology companies in mainland China and uh, uh, yeah, in, in invite them to set their, uh, their research department in Hong Kong. Because in Hong Kong, they can find more collaborators and they can find freer uh, uh, 
information here, and uh, also this kind of center can attract uh, the, uh, the the young people who would like to uh, would like to participate in science and also work further in this kind of center. Not only treat Hong Kong like a uh, like a board to go abroad to other countries. Yes, so I think this such kind of center will be a more... I think uh, you'll be happy to know yeah. that actually this is happening. This is happening. Science Park is in, a, in the forefront of this. So just recently in the last few years, I can count probably five wow. companies from mainland. From uh, Huawei, Huawei uh, yes, yes. TCL. Novo, yes, really, TCL, yeah. BGI, and, uh, and so on. Yes, really. So, so it's happening. And, I don't and, know what it's due to the help of government. Your graduate, the DJI, uh, DJI is so coming. On, yeah. Yes. So, but they are, I think they're coming for the exact same reason that you, so I'm very encouraged. In other words, I hope, and these are R&D, by the way. These are not sales department of this company. The R&D, they're hiring hundreds of people. Uh, Huawei, the director was our faculty, you know, he's just coming back, uh, actually, a few days ago, you know, November 1st. So, I think that if the government, I agree with you 100%, if the government can encourage more of that. This is sort of the general environment. Uh, and Hong Kong already has that. For example, Hong Kong is very low tax. You don't have to do anything extra. You, know, you, you provide the, the cheaper rent, you know, then they will come. And then uh, people like you, when you graduate, you have an option to stay here. Also local, local student. Then maybe more people will go into a PhD in science. It is lady here, right? So hopefully the problem will solve itself. Yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, so actually I think it's not uh, fair to compare Hong Kong with mainland China because uh, uh, Hong Kong is only a very, really small government and uh, this local government is only a part of China. So uh, instead of uh, those large science uh, targets and or, or to say some, um, uh, uh, we want to uh, grow up some local young scientists, instead of doing like that, uh, we can try to attract more mainland young scientists to Hong Kong. To do both, really. We do and do both. Okay, on that note, let's uh, thank our panelists. <laughs> yeah. I also want to take the opportunity, I don't know whether we have time to also thank, uh, first of all, our three plenary speakers this afternoon, uh, for all of you for uh, coming. I think we have to distribute the prize for the winners, so please stay for that. And uh, also thank all the organizers, you know, before we have a chance. Okay. So now I'll pass back to KS. Okay, now come to the last but not the least event today. This morning we have the this morning we have the final selection of the 2014 HKIS Young Town Guest Young Scientist Award. Now it will be the now is the announcement of the results and the presentation of the awards to the winners. Okay, this year we have all together fifty six applications, eleven in the physical mathematical science, thirteen in the life science, and thirty two in engineering science. As usual, we have three selection panels. They will review the applications and did the initial screening to shortlist some applicants. And from there, they select two award candidates. So the final selection, the two award candidates have presented this morning. And, and the audience are also participating in the voting, which contributes to 15% of the total score. Now, may I introduce the award candidates and other shortlisted applicants? Would they come up to the stage as they are being introduced? In physical mathematical science, the award candidates are Chen Su from Department of Information Engineering, CUHK. Zhao Tao Tao, Zhao Tao Tao 
Department of Chemistry, Hong Kong U. The other shortlisted applicant is Chen Chen Ai Yui, Department of Applied Physics, Poly U. In life science, in life science, we have Liu Ming, Department of Clinical Oncology, Hong Kong U. Man Chua Him, Department of Medicine, Hong Kong U. The other shortlisted applicant, Qi Shen Ping, School of Life Sciences, CUHK. For engineering science, we have, have we have An Liang, Department of Mechanical Engineering, UST, Xu Ke, Department of Electronic Engineering, CUHK. The other shortlist, shortlist uh, candidate is Duan Lin Jie. He is not in Hong Kong. Okay, now who is the winners? Who are the winners? Before I introduce the, I announce the winners, may I invite Mr. Chris Kam, Senior Engineer of the Hong Kong and China Gas Company Limited, the sponsor of the Young Scientist Award to the stage to present the awards. Now, the winner of the 2014 HKIIS Town Gas Young Scientist Award in Physical Mathematical Science is Zhao Tao Tao from Hong Kong U. And the honorable mention goes to Chen, Chen Shu from CUHK. The other shortlist applicant, Chen, uh, Chen Ai Yui, will receive a certificate. The next is the life science. Winner of the 2014 HKIS Town Gas Young Scientist Award in Life Science is Liu Ming from Hong Kong U. And the honorable mention goes to Man Chua Him of Hong Kong U. Last but not the least is the engineering science. Winner of the 2014 HKIS Town Gas Young Scientist Award in Engineering Science is Xu Ke, CUHK. The honorable mention goes to An Liang from C USD. The other shortlisted applicant, Duan Lingjie, is now in Singapore, so he is represented by Chen Shu to receive the certificate. Thank you, Mr. Kam. So now ends the Young Center World representation ceremony. Yes.
Thank you very much and congratulations to all awardees. Please be seated. Now, this is the end of the 22nd Annual Conference of HAIS. The Annual General Meeting of HAIS will be held in, at this lecture theatre right after this Annual Conference. All HAIS members are welcome to stay.